We have already seen the defer Harman key exchange and we have talked a lot about how to break discrete logarithms. So in this unit, we're going to focus solely on the specialities or specifics of when we're having a finite field discrete log problem or a finite field defer Harman system. I showed this slide before, so here's just as a recap that Diffie and Hellman, when they proposed Diffie Hellman key exchange in 1976, they were actually proposing it by using a fine field, or the integers mod p, and then the multiplicative group. And their group was actually all the integers except for zero, and they had a generator for this uh, primitive element. We've also seen with the Pauli Hellman attack that normally we want to have a subgroup of this. So in practice, we would like to have that G is a subgroup of this and that G has an element of large prime order. If you have anything that's related to the Diffie-Hellman, sorry, to decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, you actually need that G itself has a prime order because else you're giving the attacker more power to break this. Okay, so when Diffie and Hellman were proposing the key exchange, they were actually also introducing the concept of public key cryptography. And they're kind of lamenting the fact that they only gave a key exchange and not a full-fledged encryption system. Soon after, Tahir al gamal proposed a system which does solve this problem. So he's showing how to use discrete logs or a discrete log system in order to build an encryption system. Now the key generation here looks just the same as for Diffie Hellman. Now, since I'm talking about fine field discrete logarithms, I'm writing it in a multiplicative way, so it's g to the a as a public key and no longer a times b. But otherwise, there is no change here. And then the encryption works by starting basically the same as what Bob would be doing in a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So Bob picks some random k, computes g to the k, and normally Bob would just send this g to the k and then both of them can compute g to the ak. Now in the Algamon encryption system, we have to assume that the message is a group element, else this fails. Okay, but if we assume this, then, well, Bob can compute the shared key, this Alice's public key to the power k, and multiply it by m. Well, since the observer doesn't know what the message is, they also don't learn this joint key, or the other way around, since the observer doesn't know what Alice's private key is or what k Bob shows, they can't figure out what the message is. So, okay, fine, seems safe. And then Bob sends R and C to Alice. If Alice wants to decrypt this, she takes a ciphertext and divides by, well, R, which is the first component, to her private exponent A. And I've been writing that this is M, so let's prove that this is actually the message. So let's plug in what C is. Well, C was Alice's public key times the message. Now Alice's public key is g to the a, and then was raised to the kth power. So there's a g to the a k there. And then this r to the a, that's also g to the k to the a. So these two cancel, and indeed we get m. So there's some positive aspects of algorithm encryption. If you compare it with RSA, well, we have seen in RSA it was a deterministic system. This is actually a randomized system. So it's no longer the problem that there's only one encryption of a message. Here, because of the choice of k, you're getting lots of different messages, uh, sorry, lots of different ciphertexts belong to the same plain text message. And you might also prefer using discrete log-based systems because for them the key generation is a lot faster. Compared to finding two primes, p and q, with as many bits as you need, computing just an exponentiation is super easy. There's only like one randomness needed and everything here goes from there. So it's no longer this, well, get an odd number, check whether it's prime, oh, we fail again, and a random, or not random, I mean, depending on the randomness, number of loops to try this. So that's nice. It's also re-randomizable if you ever need this. So if you're seeing a ciphertext and you want to pass it on without showing that this is actually the old ciphertext, you can just pick some k prime, multiply by g to the k prime here, and Alice's public key to the k prime, the second component, and that decrypts the same message as the original one. 
That's going to be on the exercise sheet, so I'm not going to solve it here. And you can just figure this out yourself. And by the same property, you can also see that it's a homomorphic system. So if you want the encryption of m1 times m2 given ciphertexts 1 and 2, you can multiply them component-wise. Okay, that might be what you want, but it might also be not what you want. So it's also listed here as a downside, namely it is homomorphic, so as we have seen in the RSA um, talk, if it's homomorphic, you can't achieve one-way CCA2 security. Also, this requirement that the message is in the group, that's the reason why I didn't show the algorithm encryption system when we look, talked about elliptic curves. Because with elliptic curves, it's a lot harder to get that the message is actually in the group. Um, and even here, it is a problem if you want to work with subgroups. So it's a bit more impractical. And in the end, what we really want is to send a symmetric key. We don't actually care about sending messages with encryption. We care about sending a symmetric key, which we then can use for the bulk of the encryption. And this is, of course, very sensitive to subgroups. So you either say, OK, I want to have the whole group so I don't have to worry about where my m lives. So it's just an integer mod p. But then you're buying into all the subgroup attacks with Polly Hellman. And I've also shown you how subgroups break the DDHP, or you have to deal with the issue that your message needs to be mapped into the group. But let's take this as an example for subsecurity groups. So if the attacker's goal is breaking indistinguishability, so here I remind you what the indistinguishability game is like. So the attacker gets a public key, thinks long and hard about this public key, and then comes up with two messages, M0 and M1 gives them to the challenger, and then the challenger sends an encryption of this message. Now, in our case, to see this cipher, uh, this challenge there is actually a pair R comma C. So in general, it's some encryption under this public key. And well, it's one of the two, so you always have a 50-50 chance of guessing correctly. So the advantage of it is measured as everything beyond the 50%. We're only giving CPA security, uh, it's only CPA access, so that means while well, you get in the public key and nothing else. You can encrypt yourself if you want to, if it helps you, but nothing, no oracle for decryption. Okay, now DDHP, remind you, this was you're giving a triple G to the A, G to the B, some G to the C, and you want to figure out whether this matches, whether this is actually a different harmony key. So whether G to the C, is equal to g to the a times b. Now we're given a challenge for the algo model system. So here's the ciphertext that we've seen. And we need to decide if you're playing this indistinguishability game, we need to decide whether the message was zero or the message was one. Let's look at a moment for taking the the c part and dividing it by m0. So well, we can compute this thing. There's no secret information there. We're seeing the C divided by the M0, which we picked ourselves. And now, if, M, uh, if the bit was 0, then what we're seeing there is, well, the public key of Alice is the G to the A, the R is the G to the K, and now we have taken the ciphertext and divided out the M0. So we're seeing here a G to the AK. So if the... If i equals 0, what we're seeing here is a valid Diffie-Hellman trip. If i is 1, well, hmm, this looks fairly random. So the beginning is the same, but then we have an m1 in the ciphertext part, and then 0 that we're dividing out. So this is definitely not a valid trip. So if somebody gives us an oracle to decide on GDH, we can just query it on this input. So, if we can solve the discrete, uh, decision to Hellman problem, we can also break the indistinguishability under chosen plaintext attacks. Normally, we want the reduction to go the other way around. We want to figure out whether the algorithm is secure. We want to say, well, we can reduce this, uh, so we can reduce the decision to Hellman problem to breaking in CCPA. And, well, as the subject line, as the title suggests, we can do that. 
So let's jump right in. So we want to use our in CPA attack A to break BDHP. That's what it means to compute this reduction or to come up with this reduction. And so we're given such a triple, we need to figure out whether it's a valid triple. And the first step we do is, well, A needs to get a public key, so we're sending it the first component, this G to the A. Then A gives us the challenge messages. And what we do is we pick randomly, and this is really 50-50 picking, an I in 0 and 1. And then we send the G to the B that we're given now a triple. We get sending G to the C in the triple times MI. Now, the attacker, or this algorithm A, will come up back with decision. A will decide whether this is M0 or M1. And if the reply matches the I that we have chosen, so if we put in M0 and A says M0, if we put in M1 and A says M1, we're going to answer it's a valid triple. And if it doesn't match, we're going to say it's not valid. Remember, if it was the correct guess, well, up here, let's take this again 0. So if it guesses correctly and was M0, then it has actually told us that this first part and the GA are a valid triple, that it actually has this format of G to the AK. And if it says the other one, well, maybe it's not very good at breaking um, the NCPA security. Or maybe the input we had was not actually a valid triple. Okay, so let's see whether we're actually feeding A something where A can run properly. And short summary, no, we don't always, but we sometimes do. Now, if we gotten, if our challenge was a valid triple, if we're actually getting g to the a, g to the b, g to c, with this property that c equals a, b, then well, the inputs that A is getting match the inputs that A is expecting from the NCPA game. If not, well, then there is some random G to the C, which has nothing to do with Alice's public key and this R part. And so A does not get any information from the challenge ciphertext, so A doesn't have any advantage over guessing. And so we can now relate the advantage of A to the advantage that we have in breaking the decision to the Hamann problem by following this rule here. Okay, so if A has advantage epsilon and NCPA, then that means, well, it has a success probability of one half plus epsilon. And then in the case that it's a valid triple, we're getting the same success probability. If it's not a valid, a triple, which happens with 50-50, so one half probability of that, A just guesses randomly, so it has a half chance of success. And that sums together to an advantage of epsilon over 2. So that is pretty closely related. It's a factor of 2 off, but it's roughly as hard as the DHP. Now I was saying before that what we actually want to do is get a symmetric key. And so I want to choose the second half of this lecture, or the second part of this lecture, to introduce the concept of the can dem framework. So this is formalizing the idea that we use the public key system only to transport a symmetric key. So let me start with the second part, what dem expands to. So dem stands for data encapsulation mechanism. So that is just another fancy name for the normal symmetric key authenticated encryption. So we're given a secret key, we're given a message, a symmetric key and a message, and then we run our block cipher, some node or a stream cipher, and in any case, very, very importantly, we also run the Mac. So we have an authenticated encryption system. And then the first part, the chem part, is called a key encapsulation mechanism. Now the part, the first part, the key generation, looks the same as in a public key encryption system. So we're generating a key pair consisting of a public key and a private key. But that encapsulation is different from encryption. 
So encryption will be taking a public key and a message and produce a ciphertext. Encapsulation takes only a key. Okay, we'll generate some internal randomness, like they always do. So it takes this key and produces a ciphertext and a shared key. So that's the shared key for the DEM part. And then decapsulation is sort of the inverse function of encapsulation. So what decapsulation does, it takes the private key and a ciphertext and it gives you this shared key. So if you have an encapsulation, if you have a ciphertext for an encapsulation and then you decapsulate it, the, seek, the shared key you're getting is the same that the party gets who does the de uh, encapsulation. Now this is actually a good formaliz formalization of the semi-static Diffie-Hellman system. So I've seen this already some, some lectures back. Actually, it was the first discrete log system lecture where I showed this. And so if I now give you the fine field version of it, then the key generation well works just like you pick your A and you send uh, the public key is G to the A. So let me call this public key as like on the last slide H sub A. And then the encapsulation that is similar to um, semi static for Hellman, similar to the first part in Algomal. So you're picking a random exponent, you're computing uh, g to the r, and then on this value, that's the h part, that's the ciphertext. Might look strange to you to call this a ciphertext, before this was called the Diffie Hellman share, but in the ChemDM framework, this is called the ciphertext. And then the shared key that we're computing is the shared Diffie Hellman key, just like before. So we're taking Alice's public key to our r, and we're running a key derivation function on it. So the output of the encapsulation is H as a ciphertext and capital K as a shared key. And then the decapsulation, well, we want to get the same K there. So decapsulation takes this first component, the ciphertext H, raises this to our private key A, and computes the KDF on that. Well, and it gives you that K prime. And then the claim is that the k prime matches k. So let's go through that in detail. k prime is the kdf of h of a. h of a, well, that's g to the r chosen up here to the a. And so again, that is the same as Alice's public key to the power of r, which is what Bob was computing here. Okay, so this is the um, framing of static differ Hellman or semi-static differ Hellman. So Alice's key is static, Bob's key is just for the transmission. Uh, the framing of this in the ChemDM framework. So this is the modern way of thinking of um, differ Hellman encryption. You're getting a shared key out of it and you're getting a ciphertext. Well, the ciphertext previously was known as Bob's key share.